Hi, good morning. Can you hear me and see me well? There, there is an echo in my... Yes, just one moment. We're sorting out the... Testing, Hi, everyone. Hello. I, this is a youth event. I'm not seeing the vibe of young people. Hello. OK, now we can start. <laughs> OK, thank you all very much for, for joining. Uh, first of all, um, Armel from Comoros Islands. Uh, I'm an SDG4 youth activist and representing the SDG4 youth network from UNESCO. So um, I will be your moderator today. So without further ado, welcome to this event on transforming education uh, in, L in the LDC and ensuring uh, a focus on uh, inclusion and uh, gender equality. As I say, I'm a youth educational activist, mainly focusing on STEM education. Uh, I'm also uh, a feminist. So I will be moderating this session with you today. So without so further ado, we are, we are going to, to welcome uh, Ms. Stefania Giannini, who is the Assistant Director of UNESCO, who is going to give us uh, an opening remarks. And we, we all know that she, she's playing a tremendous role on transforming education in the world. Uh, and she's going to join us online. Uh, her Excellency, if you are following us, uh, the floor is to you. Hello, can you hear us? Okay, you're going to excuse us, you know, with technology, there are some uh, some issues. So without further ado, we are now I understand going to- you can start. Yeah. Oh, okay, she's back. Thank you. I hope you can hear me and see me well. Yeah. Your Excellencies, uh, Minister of Education uh, of Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Dipimoni, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Minister of, uh, Federal Minister of uh, Education uh, and, uh, and, um, Technical training of Pakistan, uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, dear Leonardo, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very pleased and very honored uh, to be able to join you all this morning, at least virtually, uh, at this important uh, uh, gathering uh, on LDC. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's important that we focus uh, uh, on education and thanks to education above all for uh, um, for convening all of us here 
Well, in the last year, uh, as we all know, the international community uh, under the leadership of the Secretary General uh, Guterres has launched an unprecedented movement to transform education and to put education on the top of the international agenda. Three UNESCO World Conferences uh, uh, covering actually all the, uh, the, the educational uh, journey on early childhood care, uh, higher education and older learning were kept uh, by the landmark uh, Transforming Education Summit which uh, was convened uh, in New York uh, by the United Nations Secretary General Guterres in September last year. And uh, pre the preparatory process uh, started in Paris uh, at the pre-summit at UNESCO. The outcomes of this summit built, uh, as, we, as we all know, on the groundbreaking report of the UNESCO International Commission on the Futures of Education and on extensive grassroots consultations in 163 countries, we should say almost the entire world. Uh, they sent, uh, all these uh, sent uh, a clear, uh, strong message. We need to build education systems for now and for the future. And we, we had to build this education system, renewing the system based on solidarity and international intergenerational dialogue and i was really struck by uh, among many other important issues but i mean very much by young people's incredible participation active role energy and resolve throughout the summit process and their commitment is apparent in the vibrant youth declaration which they draft based on contribution of almost a half a million of their peers in 170 countries. So today uh, we will have a chance, uh, and I think that the spirit of this, uh, of this event is to, to, about that, we'll have a ch chance to hear directly from young people in LDCs who are fi fighting to make change happen in education, in their countries, in their communities, in their schools, in their universities, in areas which are very much important, which are pillars of the process, gender equality, inclusion, uh, and education in crisis situation, which is increasingly an important, issues, uh, imp an important issue worldwide. We will also benefit from the deep expertise and the experience of my good friend, me, me, former Minister Leonardo Garnier, Special Advisor now on the Transforming Education Summit. And I look forward uh, to exchanging with you all during the, the session. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for those powerful words and for also continue your work on uh, involving young people into transforming education. So without further ado, we are going to, to start our discussion. And now we are going to follow a presentation by uh, Nishina Previllian, who is a postgraduate uh, student in education at the Université de Lorraine. And she is also a young researcher at the National Haitian team and also um, a youth researcher at the uh, UNESCO program. Uh, please, uh, over to you, Nishina. Thank you, Omer. Bonjour tout le monde. J'attends un peu que la présentation puisse être à l'écran. Please, there is an uh, interpretation, so for those who don't understand French, you can take your headset and get ready. Thank you.
Excellences, distingués invités, chers jeunes, bienvenue à cette présentation sur ce sujet, transformer l'éducation dans les PMA, mettre l'accent sur l'inclusion et l'équité de gens. Donc, comme l'a dit Armel, je suis Nishina Prévillon, étudiante en master en sciences de l'éducation à l'Université de Lorraine et également jeune chercheur de l'équipe haïtienne du programme Youth as Researcher de l'UNESCO. Aujourd'hui, nous allons parler de l'inclusion et de l'égalité de genre dans la question de l'éducation. Parler de l'inclusion et de l'égalité de genre, cela s'inscrit dans des contextes différents, mais complémentaires. Nous allons commencer avec l'agenda de 2030, qui nous parle des objectifs de développement durable 4 et 5, qui ne sont pas dans les mêmes, mais également qui sont complémentaires. Avec le programme d'action d'Istanbul, qui est en faveur des, des pays les moins avancés, ça met l'accent sur l'importance de prendre en compte, premièrement, les personnes en situation de vulnérabilité, mais aussi les femmes et les filles, en se penchant sur la question de l'éducation. Par ailleurs, nous avons également la crise globale, qui est économique, sécuritaire, mais il faut aussi prendre en compte la crise de la COVID-19, qui cause un énorme retard dans l'acquisition de compétences clés en général, mais qui avec beaucoup les populations en situation de vulnérabilité, ainsi que les filles et les femmes. Également, le sommet organisé sur la transformation de l'éducation en septembre recentre les conversations autour de la question de l'éducation en se focalisant sur les indicateurs de l'inclusion et de l'équité de genre. Nous sommes 46 pays décrits comme les pays les moins avancés, répartis géographiquement dans la Caraïbe, les îles du Pacifique, en Asie et en Afrique. En général, dans tous ces pays, il y a vraiment une progression dans le taux d'inscription du primaire, une augmentation générale de l'accès des filles et des garçons au niveau primaire. Cependant, ces pays ils font face à beaucoup de décrochage scolaire et pour vraiment beaucoup de difficultés à implémenter une inclusion totale. Mais ce qu'il faut noter, ce qui est important, c'est l'écart non seulement par rapport à la moyenne mondiale, mais aussi l'écart qui existe entre les différents PMA. Nous allons regarder maintenant quelques tendances en général dans les pays, que ce soit on va prendre les continents, d'abord pour l'Afrique, l'Asie, ainsi que la Caraïbe, l'Asie du Pacifique. Donc, au niveau des PMA, lorsqu'on prend exemple les pays euh, africains, il y a une augmentation générale du taux d'achèvement général et pour les filles de l'enseignement primaire. Avec Rwanda, par exemple, 67 73% des filles contre 57 46% des garçons. En Éthiopie, la RDC, la Mauritanie et le Burundi, il y a des progrès à ce niveau. Mais le taux du décrochage, il reste très élevé, que ce soit dans l'enseignement primaire, du troisième cycle et du secondaire. Le Sénégal, alors, a connu une hausse énorme en termes de décrochage, en passant de 10 à 49,53 dans les dix dernières années. Les PMA asiatiques envoient vraiment un taux d'achèvement général qui ne fait que progresser dans l'éducation primaire que ce soit pour les filles et pour les garçons. Les filles ont un taux d'achèvement plus élevé. C'est le cas du Népal, du Laos, de Timor-Leste, du Bangladesh, de Myanmar. Également, le taux du décrochage scolaire, il a diminué. Alors, pour les pays de la Caraïbe et les îles du Pacifique, nous avons Kiribati et Tuvalu, qui ont le plus haut taux d'achèvement de tous les PMA, avec un niveau de 90% pour les deux sexes. Cependant, Haïti, dans la Caraïbe, il a le taux d'achèvement le plus, plus bas, mais nous avons les filles qui ont le plus haut taux d'achèvement dans le cursus scolaire. Cependant, malgré cette hausse dans la question euh, du taux d'achèvement général, le taux du décrochage scolaire il a augmenté généralement. C'est le cas des îles Salomon, Haïti, Kiribati et Tuvalu. Donc, lorsqu'on regarde ces chiffres, il y a vraiment des indicateurs à considérer pour arriver à transformer l'éducation. Tout d'abord, il nous faut mettre l'accès général, il nous faut travailler pardon, sur l'accès général à une éducation de qualité. Donc, elle se traduit généralement par, l par mettre l'accent sur les compétences en numératie, en littératie, mais aussi les compétences scientifiques, comme l'indique le rapport de, du sommet sur la transformation de l'éducation. Les leçons apprises pendant la période COVID-19 montrent qu'une éducation de qualité se traduit aussi par un focus sur la connectivité et la culture numérique et en faisant des prévisions et des provisions pour une éducation à distance. L'éducation, elle ne peut être à la merci des crises. Il faut s'y préparer et l'épargner à tout prix. 
Additionnellement, quoique l'accès à une éducation de qualité doit avoir pour objectif de diminuer l'écart par rapport à la moyenne mondiale, il est tout important de prendre en compte les spécificités propres à chaque pays et à chaque culture, ce qui nous demande de lier la réalité locale et la réalité éducative, qui peut commencer par une promotion et une inclusion de la langue maternelle dans l'éducation. Prenons encore la question de l'inclusion et de l'égalité en éducation, important, est important et nécessaire. Alors, parce que les effets ne seront que positifs. On peut commencer par une augmentation de la croissance économique qui ne peut faire du bien qu'au pays. Cela permettrait de réduire énormément les inégalités et améliorer la qualité de vie de tous les individus. En réduisant ces inégalités, les individus, les filles, les personnes en situation de vulnérabilité ont plus de chances de s'émanciper et de créer un avenir reflétant leurs propres désirs et leurs propres ambitions. Poser la question de l'égalité de genre et de l'inclusion dans l'espace éducatif permet de changer le narratif sur les stéréotypes de genre, ce qui influera sur la quantité de filles et de femmes dans les filières STEM. Les faits, nous les connaissons, mais le pouvoir de faire bouger les choses, il se trouve dans les prochaines étapes que nous définissons. Les indicateurs, ils sont représentés par les orientations du sommet sur la transformation de l'éducation. Nous allons commencer avec la question enseignante. Les enseignants, les enseignantes, en tant que moteurs du système, doivent être pris en compte en valorisant leur profession par de meilleures conditions de travail, de meilleures conditions de développement professionnel et l'accès à des possibilités d'actualisation de compétences. Deuxièmement, faire bouger les compréhensions sur l'inclusion et les qualités de genre au cœur de partenariats ou l'un apporte le financement et l'autre la recherche. Troisièmement, les filles dans les STEM doivent être une priorité car il s'agit de changer le narratif genré et leur créer plus d'opportunités correspondant à leurs ambitions. Quatrièmement, réduire les inégalités, c'est aussi créer un environnement sain et sécuritaire à l'image de cet objectif, ce qui rend essentiel de construire les capacités des enseignants, des enseignantes sur les capacités sur la question de l'inclusion, car elle passe d'abord par leur pratique enseignante. L'enseignement et l'apprentissage distanciel se révèlent l'un des points sur lesquels travailler puisqu'ils constituent l'avenir. Mais les améliorations ne seront pas effectives si le processus n'est pas intégrateur, en incluant toutes les parties, telles que l'État, les établissements scolaires et les espaces associatifs travaillant sur les aspects technologiques. Maintenant, je voudrais parler d'Haïti, parce que c'est l'histoire d'un pays que je connais, puisque c'est le mien. Mon expérience se résume à la fois en tant qu'étudiante, mais aussi en tant qu'enseignante. Probablement, mon histoire, elle va se ressembler à beaucoup de celles d'autres jeunes. La situation, de l'éducation, la situation d'Haïti montre que la question de l'éducation doit être répondue en prenant en compte tout le système. Certes, nous avons fait quelques progrès dans le taux d'achèvement pour les filles, mais nous avons le taux le plus bas par rapport aux pays de la Caraïbe et les îles du Pacifique. Haïti ne fait qu'aller de crise en crise. Bon, en fait, les crises, elles se chevauchent et affectent énormément les élèves, que ce soit dans la fermeture fréquente des établissements par rapport à une insécurité insupportable et l'augmentation du stress chez les enfants. Du coup, les cas au niveau local, ils s'agrandit énormément parce que peu d'élèves peuvent vraiment profiter de l'enseignement à distance quand il y a peu d'écoles qui peuvent offrir cette opportunité. Cet écart aussi s'agrandit par rapport à l'international, puisqu'il est difficile de construire les compétences du 21e siècle. Donc, pour donner une meilleure offre en éducation, il est important d'avoir une stabilité, une vision globale qui mobilise les acteurs de l'éducation. Nous avons notre chien Nelson Mandela qui a dit que l'éducation, c'est l'arme la plus puissante pour changer le monde. Mais cette arme, elle ne sera pas puissante si elle n'est pas accessible à tous les individus. Oui, à l'éducation, mais comme l'a dit Leonardo Garnier, le conseil spécial du secrétariat général du sommet sur la transformation de l'éducation, il faut éduquer tout le monde. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Nishina, for for that uh, detailed presentation on how we should uh, transform education in LDC's country. And we all know that as we are here today, 
uh, in this conference to talk about the issue that is affecting the LDC country. And we all know that we cannot move forward on those issues if we don't start within education. Education is really a, a key component on the development of our country. But as today we are focusing on ensuring and the um, inclusion and gender equality in education, which we all know that uh, education, if it's not inclusive, it cannot be like a quality one. It should be inclusive. And if we talk about an inclusion, it should also be intersectional because we all know that there are different gender. So we have to include everyone within the world we are living now today. So we are now going to move uh, on our second segment, which is uh, the, the panel with our honorable ministers who are present here with us today. So we are here with the, the Minister of uh, Education of uh, Bangladesh, Her Excellency Dr. Dipu Moni, and also the, the Minister of uh, Federal Education and Professional Training of Pakistan, His Excellency Mr. Rana Taver. Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for, for your time. Please give a round of applause for our ministers. Uh, thank you again, Minister, for joining us today. Uh, we are going to start our session. I'm going to start with uh, Excellency. Uh, as we are talking uh, about the Transforming Education Summit, um, Your Excellency, the Honorable Czech Hasina, Prime Minister of uh, Bangladesh, made a powerful statement at the Transforming Education that was held in September in New York and underlined your country commitment or to reduce gender gaps in education. As the first female minister of Bangladesh, how are you leading effort to improve access and rotation to education at all level, especially for girls in your country? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I thank the government of Qatar and UNESCO and Global Education Cooperation Mechanism for jointly organizing this very pertinent discussion. It is indeed our common responsibility to lead the transforming education discourse in a world order which is vastly divided in many aspects with numerous competing uh, priorities, but nothing should deviate us from our firm conviction of leaving no one behind. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown us off track uh, from attaining SDG 4. Gains made have been lost. Our impediments in learning loss and recovery, gender disparity, lack of inclusiveness, teaching and uh, teachers' capabilities and funding gap became evident in this crisis. And this is perhaps more true of the least developed countries. Bangladesh has been an active partner since UNESCO and GEM coined the idea of transforming education. We have been engaged in the E9 process, the High Level Steering Committee, and in the Advisory Committee for the Transforming Education Summit. As one of the LDCs, we realize the needs and challenges of the country's incomparable uh, milieu, particularly the lack of inclusiveness, gender disparity, and gaps in funding for transforming education uh, draws our priority. As um, you have uh, uh, asked about girls' education, especially girls' education. Uh, let me um, uh, begin by girls' education, where we are now recognized as a champion. Bangladesh was no different uh, than the usual socioeconomic barriers that girls have been facing in many other countries and regions. We have gradually moved out of those. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, placed education, particularly for girls, at the top of her development agenda. While girls' education was only for the few financially solvent, uh, we promoted girls' education as a means of financial support. Tuition fees for girls were made free up to the tertiary level. Uh, our secondary school stipend program was not a program uh, per se, uh, rather a policy strategy to mitigate the socioeconomic challenges. Parents now realize the benefit of educating their girls. There uh, has been a sea change uh, in their mindset. Building, uh, just uh, if we think about building separate washrooms for girls in schools, um, I think 
it was a relatively small and uh, easy intervention which played a significant role uh, in improving girls enrollment and retention in schools uh, realization of our honorable prime minister's digital bangladesh vision also helped girls education and participation uh, in the labor force more girls uh, are in school now uh, than boys which is reflected in our current uh, male female enrollment ratio of 49 to 51 dropout rate has drastically reduced from 39.8% to 17.2% in last 10 years ladies and gentlemen having uh, closed the gender gap we are now moving to the next step uh, to include the youth in education our generation breakthrough a uh, project provided support to 140,000 young people between the age of 10 and 19 with life skills and knowledge at the initial stage the project was operational in 300 uh, secondary schools 50 religious schools and 150 adolescent clubs across bangladesh it also used innovative approaches to positively shift attitudes and behaviors around gender roles gender based violence and sexual and reproductive health Uh, as a result empowered young people can uh, reach their full potential and contribute more to social and economic development now we have planned to implement it in all our 33000 secondary level institutions all over the country uh, in phases with regard to inclusion we are happy to share that since 2012 we have supported almost 330000 out of school children and ensured their access to education our civil society and non government organizations have joined hands with the government and our collective efforts were supported uh, by the educate a child program recently the program was further strengthened through the involvement of the asian development bank this has enabled us to mitigate the funding gaps and accelerate our aims to remove all barriers to accessing quality primary education we are now working together to enroll another 650000 out of school children in bangladesh um now let us look at the uh, global scenario briefly around 287 million young people of primary and secondary school age live in ldcs which accounts for approximately 19% of the world's population in this age group the primary school enrollment rate reached 81% in 2017 however about 28 million children are still out of school uh, many of whom are from the ldcs and being a member of the high level steering committee this is not a statistics that makes us optimistic over a billion people living in the 46 ldcs constitute 13% of world population while they account for only 1.3% of global gdp the potential for creative and innovative development strategies of these people is immense but we need to come forward to put an end to the spiral of exclusion in which uh they're uh, trapped in bangladesh we have also um started to implement our new uh, curriculum where the whole learning approach um is has changed it is experiential learning la- now learning by doing instead of uh, rote learning uh, assessment methods have also changed uh, from an only an exam based uh, to both summative and formative assessments Uh, we are focusing more on enhancing competencies in languages ict science maths soft skills values and entrepreneurship um we are also emphasizing on uh, tvet um technical and vocational uh, education and training uh, we are focusing more and more on teachers training and use of appropriate technologies and as i said a very simple interventions of uh, um some infrastructure changes which enable everyone uh, to participate so um we have an ambitious goal of transforming education at hand and we have a very strict deadline uh, we need to be mindful of the gaps uh, if we want meaningful outcomes from this endeavor uh, we talked about inclusion we talk about safety pedagogical reforms digital inclusion gender disparity and most importantly financing for education but we need to realize that the ldcs need our special attention to deploy adequate support mechanism for them to realize our common vision and we have to reach that vision uh, let the transformation begin with the ldcs thank you 
Thank you very much, uh, Her Excellency, for sharing those uh, approaches that Bangladesh is using to transform education uh, in Bangladesh. And we all know that uh, those are approaches that the other country from LDC can also take in order to develop uh, our, our, our countries, because we believe that there won't be any sustainable development without quality and inclusive education for all. Thank you very much, Her Excellency, for sharing. Oh, now we are going to uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Rana Tamvir. Thank you very much for joining us. Your Excellency, you also spoke at the Transforming Education Summit on the devastating impact of the floods uh, on education in Pakistan. So we wanted to know what step has your ministry taken to ensure that the most marginalized children and young people can learn? And what challenges remain now? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very important question. And uh, during the uh, Transforming Education Summit in uh, New York I, uh, and then uh, Neva, I uh, tried to uh, Give realization to global community about uh, the flood, the devastating effect of uh, flood which uh, affected Pakistan and Pakistan economy, especially education sector. So uh, this uh, question is very important for us, and uh, definitely I will explain. The immediate uh, impact of floods on education in Pakistan have been severe. Recent estimates suggest that over 34,000 public education institutions were damaged or destroyed. And at least 2.6 million students in the country have been affected by the floods. The total cost of loss and damage to education is estimated to be 780 million US dollars. Ministry of Education and the uh, government of Pakistan has taken a number of important measures to ensure children, including the most marginalized, return to learning after the floods. In response to 2022 floods, the government of Pakistan and the UN have combined to ensure education features strongly in the recovery of plan for Pakistan. The Resilient Recovery, Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Framework, or RF, launched at the UN on 9th January 2023. This plan has raised uh, over 9 billion US dollars from the international community to support Pakistan recovery. But uh, all these are pledges are still uh, not uh, uh, realized, fully realized, but we are expecting definitely they, uh, uh, all those countries from us, they will come forward and support Pakistan. It sets out key priorities for the education recovery from the floods and particularly the rebuilding of infrastructure and climate resilient schools short term and recovering learning loss through remedial education long term. Both federal and provincial ministries have worked in collaboration with donor partners to deliver the financing design. Implementation and reporting as part of UN OCH revised response plan that aims to target that 700,000 children most in need. As of January 2023, education sector partners have reached over 203,000 children and adults out of 700,000 targets. Funding for floods education emergency response stands at 60% of total us for 40 million US dollars. Ministry of Education continues to work especially hard to protect children in crisis, especially ensuring adequate funding. In February, the Ministry of Education addressed the education cannot wait high-level financing. 
conference in geneva who advocate for increased support for pakistan children affected by the floods and other emergencies few challenges remain the flood emergency was a crisis that added to existing education challenges firstly the need to bring out of school children back to school pakistan currently has estimated 22.8 million children out of school the high, the highest number in the world <clears throat> and uh, uh, affected by uh, the uh, flood that uh, added in this number uh, recent back secondly to improve learning first those already to in school and address learning lost in the covid-19 pandemic in pakistan 3 in 4 children cannot cannot read a simple sentence by the age of 10 finally to make an education system res- resilient to the emergencies and increase access through technological solutions and distance learning full funding is required for the un ocha response plan provincial education department need considerable technical financial support to rebuild schools and urgently ensure children return to learning the resilient recovery rehabilitation or reconstruction framework provides the plan for implementation is needed and just see measures are required to ensure children returning to this year or many will drop out permanently research by the world bank suggests that as many as 1 million children may drop out and not return to school as a result of the flood damage to education long term resilience of the education system must be planned and implemented to ensure the education system are resili- resilient to future disaster we are also focusing on uh, girl education especially and uh, recent back we have appointed a uh, ambassador for education uh, in uh, ambassador of education ministry for girls education and that is also a uh, female women leader so uh, we are focusing on girls education and hopefully we will uh, decrease this number also and uh, we uh, at the end we uh, again ask uh, global community and uh, donors come forward and uh, support pakistan so uh, the out of school children and specially affected by the flood that we can read and take them back to education system and uh, put them in school thank you very much <clears throat> thank you very much his excellency and we thank you and your government for being resilient in sh- ensuring that uh, young children are uh, have been able to go to school despite all the issue and the climate change that is really affecting Pakistan. Thank you very much, uh, ministers. Now we are going to the important session. Do we have young people in this room? No, I don't think so. Do we have young people in this room? Yeah. Aha, that's a young people vibes. Okay, now we are going to the, the, to the youth segments and we are really honored to have uh, the um, the advisor of the transforming education mr leonardo garnier here with us who is also uh, a youth champion because he really supports uh, young people and really uh, advocate for youth inclusion and youth engagement we're really happy happy and honored to have him with us so we are we'll be joining with the uh, and there are outstanding young people from the LDC countries who are going to share their um, perspective and also the work that they are doing in their countries so for for the opening of our session we are also going to have uh, uh, Ms Stefania Janini who's going to give us a we're going to give us an opening remarks i don't know if she is online Oh, you are here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Stefania Giannini, for joining us again. We are happy to see you again. Uh, please, the floor is to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, 
for this uh, inspiring uh, dialogue. And first of all, let me thank once again uh, Minister uh, Di Pumoni uh, of Bangladesh and Minister uh, Tamber Hussain of Pakistan for their really exemplary commitment and leadership. Well, uh, all the topics uh, we discuss uh, and the action you share uh, with us are really showing uh, real concrete results on the ground. And this is very important because this is exactly what the follow-up uh, uh, to the transforming uh, summit uh, education summit uh, process is about moving uh, beyond uh, commitments which are very much important is our political capital so so to say to action and uh, when uh, we say a little bit uh, something about the, the beginning of this uh, of this uh, process and this initiative when deputy secretary general Amina Mohammed approach, pro, approach UNESCO uh, to play uh, a key role uh, both in uh, contributing to shape uh, the Transforming Education Summit uh, through the Futures of Education report and all the work that our team is still doing and hosting the summit in June. We are both very clear on many issues, but especially on one which is about the role of young people. We, we are both convinced that young people had to be at the heart of this process. And we agree that uh, education systems uh, need to be reimagined to make them fit for the future. And this would only be possible if young people and students were engaged at all stages of the process. And, that, and actually, that's what's happening now. This is why the youth-led and youth-organized mobilization day kick-started the summit on the 16th September. Many of you were there. You remember for sure a very exciting, energetic time. And uh, as already mentioned earlier, that's why the youth declaration was drafted by young people themselves based on contributions uh, from almost a half, of me half a million of their peers uh, in, uh, in 170 countries, which is impressive and uh, actually unprecedented, at least for education. So through these steps, uh, young people succeeded in bringing a, a real wake-up call uh, to leaders. And we are not letting it stop uh, here. That's, uh, that's the point. Uh, on the International Day uh, of Education uh, this year, on the 24th of January, uh, UNESCO and its partners launched the two-year Global Youth Initiative in New York. And uh, this is the world's first multi-stakeholder global initiative that aims to ensure meaningful youth engagement and leadership in education policy making. And this is a, a, a direct outcome of the test. Uh, and now uh, the, the High Level Steering Committee for SDG4, where, by the way, uh, Minister uh, Di Pumoni is, is, a, is an active member, uh, and many of you are uh, directly or indirectly uh, involved and committed to make the process going on, uh, uh, staking the, le the leadership in terms of uh, monitoring and in terms also of uh, providing uh, uh, the international community with uh, with the right approach and the right um, you know support to make uh, this process going ahead with concrete results so uh, this this process is also based on the idea that to transform education really young people need access to resources need access to real opportunities to be involved in decision making processes and that the youth and student movements need to connect and cross fertilize among each other and with other stakeholders and that's what also we are trying to facilitate through the governance of SDG4. So without further ado, uh, uh, let's get uh, this dialogue started and uh, happy to to, to listen to the second part of the meeting. Thank you so much, over to, to you. Thank you so much for sharing those inspiring words with us. Uh, as you said, we are going to start the important station because uh, this is the youth segment and we know that we young people, we always have a lot of questions to ask to ministers and those who are at the decision-making process so we are going to start uh, our conversation. Um, going to welcome Mr. Sylvain Obedi, 
please, you have one minute to introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Please, can we have the mic? Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour la parole m'accordée. Je m'appelle Sylvain Obedi Katindi et je suis euh, un, membre, un ancien membre du Conseil consultatif des jeunes et a travaillé avec Education Above All au commissariat des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme et CILTEC. Euh, je suis également un activiste pour les droits de personnes handicapées. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo. Alors, je vais aller euh, droit. Euh, au fait, sur base euh, de mon expérience personnelle et de la situation euh, de la République démocratique du Congo ou de l'Afrique sur euh, euh, le contexte d'accès à, à l'éducation pour euh, les, les personnes handicapées, euh, Nil n'ignore qu'il y a plus euh, euh, de situations ou de barrières qui ne le permettent pas qu'il ait Uh, l'accès uh, universel ou, ou inclusif pour uh, les, les personnes handicapées. Et la situation de Covid-19 est venue encore uh, augmenter ces, uh, ces, ces problèmes qui existaient déjà des barrières et ce qui n'a pas facilité encore cet apprentissage. Il y a eu uh, plus uh, des jeunes ou des enfants qui ont abandonné parce qu'ils ne pouvaient pas uh, participer à l'éducation qui devait être euh, maintenant à distance suite à, 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 à des matériels non, à, non adaptés à leur euh, situation d'handicap. Maintenant, euh, ma question euh, à M. Euh, Léonard, c'est de savoir euh, comment est-ce que euh, le processus du sommet de transformation de l'éducation va favoriser l'inclusion euh, des personnes euh, handicapées, tout en ayant en tête aussi l'aspect lié à au, 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 la problématique des données. Parce que nous savons que s'il faut aller dans le sens de trouver les statistiques sur ceux-là, il y a un handicap qui ont même fini l'école primaire ou secondaire ou universitaire, c'est difficile de pouvoir savoir. Alors c'est ce que j'aimerais savoir, quelles sont ces, ces, ces nouvelles approches que ce sommet a, a mises en place pour répondre à ces à ces gaps. Merci. Thank you very much, Sylvain, for your question. Uh, I do believe the question was addressed to Mr. Leonardo Garnier, who is also the special advisor on transforming education. So I do believe he's the right person to to break that question and give us answer. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for that question. If I was Minister of Education for eight years, and if there is an area where I can truly say that I learned things that are, were different from my previous way of thinking, it was about disabled persons with, with disabilities in, in education. There is a lot of ideology, supposed common sense, traditional ways of looking at, at persons with disability in, in education, and it's almost as if we are making them the favor of letting them go to school. But we don't really think they can learn. And, and you see that all over the world, the, the, the reaction of schools, of, of educational institutions towards people with disability is, ah, we don't want that problem. In fact, I, I don't know many countries, but in, in Latin America you find that a lot of times uh, some of the best educational institutions get rid of students with disabilities so that they go to other schools because they don't want that problem. But that's morally irre reprehensible, uh, but that's also educationally stupid. No one, I mean, when, when we talk about disabilities first, we would have to start thinking about children and students as different. They are all different. And this also has to do with the problem in education when teachers and schools want to treat everybody as the same and they should move at the same pace and they should learn in the same way. No, they don't. But this is especially true for persons with 
disabilities or, or different abilities. So the, the approach coming from TESS and, and from many, from the UNESCO's report, as, as Stefania was saying, is first of all one of inclusion. Education is for all, for all children. It doesn't matter if they are uh, with different abilities, if they have problems with their sight, with their ears, with their hands, or as we can see later, if they uh, speak another language, for example, which is a different way of having the same, the same problem. So the, the first thing is to understand the educational process as a process of integration. The second thing you have to understand is that this is not easy. And, and this is very important because sometimes you have like the good intentions of saying, okay, we have to include everybody. But if, when you tell a teacher that has a group of 40 students where five or six have disabilities to handle that class, that's difficult. That, that's not a burden that you can put on a single teacher. This is a problem that has to be acknowledged and solved by the educational system as a, as a whole. That's one thing. The second thing has to do with justice. And this is something we sometimes don't understand. We, we see persons with disability as individual problem or as the problem of family. That's not true. That's a problem of society. Some of us will have some abilities and some will have others, some will have some disabilities, and that's a problem we have to face as a society. It is not fair that a family that has that problem has to face it. It is not fair, as I was saying, that the specific teacher has to face it. You have to solve this as an institutional problem, with an institutional approach. In the following from TESS, there was a call to action about this, and one of the things they say is that they want to promote in this call of action a twin track approach, which is on the one hand, all should be included. And that's true, they all should be included. But on the other hand, they need special support. And those two things have to go hand in hand. And there is a third thing I learned when I was dealing with these cases in, in Costa Rica. And that is something usually not mentioned, is how the rest of the children in the classroom and the teachers, but especially the children, learn about life when they have classmates with different kinds of abilities. This is learning about life, because that's life. You will have that. You will have it in your house. You will have it in a cousin's house, in the bus, whatever. And having in the classroom people with different abilities and learning to help each other, to learn together, is part of the educational process. So instead of looking at that as a problem, as, as saying this kid that cannot read fast enough is holding the group, you no, know, this kid is teaching the group that they have to move together. And, and this, as, as the minister was saying before, this has to do with changing the mindset. And this is probably the most difficult thing. You have to change the mindset in the families, because sometimes families think that their disabled kid is not really worth it. He cannot or she cannot make it, and they can. You have to change the mindset of students, teachers, principals in schools are, are very important, and of course, of, of those who take the, the decisions. <clears throat> Finally, because this is about the, the youth movement, uh, I think this is a subject that should be taken by the youth initiative as one of their struggles. Because they have to incorporate this in their fight for inclusive education. Be very vocal about how do we do so that these children really get the opportunity of being part of the education. That's Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leonardo, for, for those powerful. Just to summarize, we believe that it's not easy to include everyone, but we have to, to start somewhere, and we do need justice. And also, it's not only about education, but it's also about empathy and social life, because you may be educated, but know how to socialize and also how to accept everyone. 
And we young people have also our role to contribute. Thank you very much for those points. Now I'm going to pass uh, the floor to Arid Masri, a young uh, woman from Syria who is here with us. Uh, please, uh, you have one minute to introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Good morning. It's okay to have two minutes. <laughs> yep. So my name is Eris Mosri. I'm from Syria and a former Education Above All OHCHR Soletic Youth Advisory Board member. As you all know, my country has been in conflict for around 12 years now. Educational facilities and personnel have been attacked and targeted nonstop, resulting in a massive damage to the infrastructure. According to OCHA, the country had witnessed 1,138 attacks on educational facilities only between 2011 and 2022, leaving 2.4 million children out of school. Northwest Syria is home to 4.5 million people, of whom 2.8 of them are internally displaced and living in conditions that lack the basic human rights. For years, this area has been a target of military operations, leading to the destruction of infrastructure, with education being one of the most severely impacted. Children's education in northwestern Syria is frequently disrupted, not only because of attacks and facilities, but also because of recurrent displacement, poverty, child labor, and child marriages. Just before the earthquake, several schools in northwestern Syria had closed due to the lack of funds. Schools that were managed to keep operating have been heavily affected by the earthquake causing an increased number of children dropping out of school at least for months. Education in Northwest Syria is deteriorating day by day. More children are being left without learning. We as youth advocates have always called for more support to implement sustainable programs that ensure the equity and continuity of education. But unfortunately, little has been done only, leaving us wondering as about our role as youth advocates in pushing for change. I believe that transforming education is the most urgent necessity now in Northwest Syria. We need more than ever to start thinking of a way to ensure that these young people are not left behind. COVID-19 had shown us that with our current capabilities and resources, we can adapt to the most difficult circumstances if we only have the will to take action. Recently, we have seen the disappointing response of the international community to the earthquake in northwest Syria, which left millions in dire need of assistance, specifically children, putting more responsibility on us as youth advocates to keep the pressure for change. So my question to, Ms. to Mr. Garnier, in your opinion, how education can be successfully transformed in a region like northwest Syria and what more can young advocates do to make sure that transforming education remains at the heart of the global uh, sustainable development agenda? Thank you. That's, that's a difficult question. Uh, I think that the, the, the first thing we should understand in, in the kind of cases you were mentioning is that Syrian children and youth did not decide to have a war, or Pakistan did not decide to have floods, or Turkey and Syria did not decide to have an earthquake. These things happen. They are part of the risk with which we live. And when we talk about risk, we usually have instruments to deal with risk, but we haven't been willing to do that in these cases. Let, let me give you just a, a very silly example about insurance for, for fire in a house. I know there is a risk that my house will burn. Uh, it is very expensive for me to save all the money that I will need to rebuild my house. So I take an insurance. A lot of people put a little money in case their houses burn, a few houses burn. We pay them for everybody, and everybody knows that when 10% of what they save will pay other people's houses. 
That's insurance. And what we are talking here is about risk, environmental risk, political risk, uh, sometimes related to human-produced events like in climate change, other times just like an earthquake. But the terrible thing, and, and you very well put it, is that when these tragedies happen in the poorest countries, the rest of the world had not created an insurance for that. So in the end, what happens is that the money is like a favor, like, yes, we're going to help you a little bit. But that's not the way you handle risk. We need a new institutional framework for handling risk, especially since we have examples like climate change, and this has to do more with climate justice than just with risk, where some of the countries have produced many of the damages, and it's the poorest countries that are seeing the, the result. So the first thing I, I would say to, to your question, and I know this is a very, uh, you, you say that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. I think we have to change the discussion in the world about risk. This is a discussion that has been going on for quite a long time, but, but we have to move so that when it happens, there is a fund for those countries that, that have the problem or those children that, that have the problem. Then on, on the other side, since this is a, a question of, of, again, the youth movement, I would say, okay, this is also, like I was saying in the case of, of disabled children, this is also a cause for the youth movement. We should start talking with economists and experts in financing and experts in, in, in insurance and try to build this idea and pressure for it. These things don't happen because of the will, goodwill of somebody. It's not that somebody would say, oh, poor countries, we're going to create this big insurance and we will pay taxes in all the world to help some poor countries. That's not going to happen. You need pressure. And if you have a youth movement for education and education is suffering from these risks, I think that one of the things this youth movement could make is pressure for having in the world this financial insurance for tragedies like the ones you, you mentioned. It's, it's the only way. If not... I mean, it's, it's completely impossible. When, when we saw yeah. the floods in, in your country, it's impossible for, for a country to solve those problems on itself, especially if it's a poor country. So one, one final comment comes from Adam Smith, who, who was not just the founder of economics, but a professor of moral, of moral philosophy. And he said that when human beings, when, when in his language, when man sees that someone close to him uh, faces a disgrace, you feel his disgrace because he's close to you, even if it's a small disgrace. He says that you feel the disgrace more if it's a big disgrace. But he also says that the farther it is from you, the less you feel the disgrace. And one of the problems here is that some countries feel that other countries are too far. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leonardo Garnier, for those powerful words. Now we are going to proceed with uh, our conversation. And for now, we are going to hear a, a statement from um, Elham Mansour from Afghanistan. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Elham Mansouri, and uh, I'm from Afghanistan. I'm also the member of Afghan Girls Robotics Team. A country where today their girls and women don't have the right of education, uh, work, or even a normal life. Many of you know about this, but uh, for the women of Afghanistan, it feels like the world has all but forgotten them behind. I remember when I was seven or eight years old child, I always watched an animation, and I love it. Uh, the name of this animation was Omakasa Scarper, whose actors uh, were robots, and having one of those robots uh, was my childhood dream. A dream that uh, never happened for me at that time. Time would pass, and I think I still couldn't uh, get robot out of my mind. Uh, 
Uh, I, uh, then I had a, an amazing opportunity and I joined to the Afghan girls robotics team, the first robotics team in Afghanistan that the member, the all member are girls. It was not an easy start when we start and the, the many people not agree with us because of the traditional society Afghanistan has. Uh, the most people think engineering only is a field uh, for, uh, for men. Uh, we therefore feel that it was our responsibility to change uh, this opinion and uh, show a new uh, opinion and perspective of Afghanistan, women of Afghanistan for the world. With the Afghan Dreamers, we built a lot of robots in, uh, and pa we participate in an uh, international competition, as well as uh, to solve our community problem like uh, wheat robot, saffron robot, a ventilator, UVC, a spray robot, drone, and, and my de mine detector. Uh, today, I can say proudly, we changed the opinion and uh, we show a different side of Afghanistan for the world. We show the unstoppable power and ability of Afghan women. Most people support us and encourage us. We all wanted to become engineers different, in different sections. This was my and thousands of Afghan girls' normal life. But that all changed in 2021, in 6th of the August, when the Taliban capture of Afghanistan, and thousands of people become refugee like me today. Today we... Today we as Afghan women and girls are not allowed to go to a school, park, gyms, that they are the basic human for everyone. It's hard for me to say these all things because I experienced all this. I stand here today to remind you that today marks exactly 531 days since we, since we as Afghan girls have been thrown in the, a dark prison. 531 days since the Taliban imposed the hijab, but they banned education for for the dear illogical reason. I see, I see the other girls and women from other countries, also Islamic country, that they have the access to education, business, politics, engineering, and other fields. And I see the girls and women from my country, they cry behind the, they cry behind the closed door of a school and university, and their dream only go back to their school and university. So today my message for you, dear leaders, if you wanted to make a better world with peace and justice, you should educate every girl and boy around the world because it's our responsibility. Today, if I have this opportunity and I have access to education and I can be an inspiration for other girls, imagine if you give the same opportunity for other girls, what would happen? Yes, they will become engineers, Future, the future engineers, scientists, and astronomers, and leaders for a better world. Please provide safe, equal, and free education opportunity for all Afghan refugees wherever they are. And for the girls and women still in Afghanistan, it's time to show an action, a real action. That kind of action the Afghan girls and women know that the world hasn't forgotten them in the bottom of a dark well and hasn't, for, for, and hasn't left them alone. We need you, world readers, to hear us and show an action. Take real action, not empty promises. Remember, education for everyone is the key for a better tomorrow. Thank you very much, Elham, for those powerful words. And it's so inspiring. And we, we encourage your, your, your voice for not giving up, for always advocating for young girls of Afghanistan and inspiring other girls from, from all the world. I can take an example. I'm a, I'm a STEM educator, and I've been inspired by all your stories. So uh, you are inspiring many girls out there. And we hope that all of them will get the opportunity to be educated and to be who, who they want to be in the future. Keep it up and thank you very much. So um, 
without uh, wasting time, we are going to open the floor for questions now. If uh, anyone has questions to ask to, to our honorable speakers, but with the uh, because of time, we are not going to take many questions. So uh, I believe the teams have the mic. So, okay, over to you. Yeah. Do you want to choose some? There is one hand Ladies here in first. the front. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lamar Zalogran. I'm an advocate of education and yacht uh, there in Afghanistan. I run an organization in Afghanistan where I teach uh, 200 of students inside Afghanistan. I'm, uh, I'm a columnist and writer at the Spiegel newspaper. Uh, my question would be, thousands of billion, more than billions of girls have been uh, banned from education. They haven't been allowed in Afghanistan to attend schools or universities. It has been uh, two years since uh, schools, and, uh, schools and universities are closed for women. They have been erased from social, political, and economic life. All of the uh, women in Afghanistan, they have lost their jobs in private sectors and also in government sectors. Women of Afghanistan nowadays they don't, have the, uh, they don't have the right to participate in the politics of Afghanistan, hold ministerial position and also government position. So my question would be how this summit will help thousands of Afghan women inside Afghanistan. Is this summit will give a hope for the women of Afghanistan and they will they, is this summit will help women with their rights inside Afghanistan? Is there any solution for Afghan women who is depressed of having no right in my country where whenever they go out of home they should carry a male garden, they have to stay at home 24-7, depressed, and they don't have mental health and also physical safety in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, anyone want to take the floor? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eba. Uh Before this question, I want to respond to uh, young uh, well, the question, the uh, responsibility of international community to give uh, education all uh, uh, refugees, girls, the refugees. So in Pakistan, we have almost 3 million refugees. And uh, we are uh, uh, looking after them uh, very well. And uh, we are giving education to all uh, girls, uh, girls coming from Pakistan and settled in Arabia. And so we are there. But uh, the condition, as mentioned in Afghanistan, is uh, very bad. And uh, especially when these uh, in Afghanistan, no doubt. But uh, the international community, I don't know about uh, other countries, but Pakistan. Care of all the education sector, especially. As far as uh, the second question is concerned, I don't know uh, what the Russian community can do in this regard. We, uh, inside Pakistan, whoever comes from Pakistan, we uh, look after them and uh, also uh, taking care of. Um, there are um, hundreds of um, Afghan girls uh, who are studying in uh, one of our universities, Asian University for Women, and they're doing really well, and uh, we're welcoming them. And recently, um, many more joined, and some are still waiting to join. So um, we fully understand, and um, uh, it's a huge problem. And um, we, unless this whole um, the war games, uh, if they don't stop, there will be more, more and more girls, even boys, uh, who will be out of schools. So while we are talking about bringing in more boys and girls to schools, uh, we are also producing arms, uh, producing ammunitions, uh, which could, uh, 
the the money is spent for those could very well be used for feeding those children all around the world and and educating them so those who are producers of arms and ammunition i think they should unless they stop it's not going to stop so uh, we can all keep talking about it but it's um, wars don't just happen uh, happen for causes and those who produce those arms and ammunition it's their business too so uh, as sufferers uh, and and also we see sufferings in our neighborhood uh, so and and we also um, have more than 1 million rohingyas uh, who fled myanmar uh, for safety and security and uh, we are protecting them we are giving them shelter in bangladesh uh, and also providing healthcare and education and other facilities um, so we see we see the uh, plight uh, all the time so it, it needs to stop we can we can all go on talking about it but it will not stop until those uh, who have the power to stop it they don't stop Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to take uh, one question for this side. Um, Nadine. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Juliet from Nigeria. And um, in my country, uh, it's unfortunate and it pains me that students who graduate from school and they will be looking for job from one place to another and uh, the rate of unemployment in my country is very obvious to the world so uh, as a concern um, just I have a question and it's uh, how can we make entrepreneurship education more effective and impactful for students right from primary education primary school all through to high school and even university, so that at every stage of education, students will build on their skills, their passion, their interest, and create a viable uh, business around it. In essence, how can we make our students to be job creators and not job seekers? Any um, solutions that I can take back to my country will be welcome. Thank you. that question, I think that the, the answer has to do to, to look at this from both sides. Uh, usually we think of education as producing educated people that will find work. And we forget about the economy. And I've been wondering for, for a long time in my life, why is it that we all say that this is, it is very important to finance education, but we never do it. Yesterday I was talking about that. And, and probably one of the reasons, especially in, in mid, lower middle and, and lower income countries, is that our economy depends on having very cheap, low skilled labor. That's the market for, for labor. So when some few people manage to study more, the economy is not really there for them to work. That's not the kind of economy. But it's, it gets worse, because when you tell to those ministers of finance or the business community to, for example, let's pay more taxes to finance a better education, they will say, we don't need a better education. Our economy is working just fine with this relatively cheap labor. <clears throat> so if you want to change education, you have to change the economy. And the only way to change the economy is to change education. Those two things should be part of a single government strategy. Many times in the UN, we talk about whole of government approaches. And, and he, this is probably one of the best examples. The relation between the Minister of Education and the Ministers of Finance shouldn't be one of the Minister of Education asking for more money and the Minister of Finance saying, I don't have more money. It should be both of them together creating the long-term investment for a different kind of, of economy. 
And many countries have done it. This is not something that we are inventing. This is the story of many successful countries. Thank you very much for, for those uh, clarification. Uh, uh, we are really sorry because of time. We cannot take uh, other question. But uh, you are most welcome to bring your question or your solution. I'm the youth advisor to the Transforming Education and also an active member to the SDG4 Youth Network, who is really working along with the High Level Steering Committee uh, in order to transform education worldwide. So um, without uh, further ado, we are going to, to close uh, our session, which we all know that we, we have uh, a lot to do. And uh, it's not only the government or the, um, or the high, the high level steering committee who can bring solution, but we all have to put our hands on desk because we all can contribute on the development of our different countries. So uh, it's all our duty to, to keep up the work we are doing as a, as a young people and also to, to call on our leaders uh, to, to count them uh, accountable and also for a meaningful youth engagement because we really want to be involved on the decision-making process, on the implementation of, of the work for the development of our country. So for that say, I'm going to, to welcome the Assistant Director General for Education for UNESCO, if she is online with us, to give us the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Armel. Thanks all of you once again uh, for this uh, really rich, inspiring uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we heard uh, uh, very many different points of view, but also very much uh, touching uh, uh, speeches, interventions. I'm thinking of uh, Elam, uh, among the other panelists who actually brought out the, the real topic of, of what, uh, which is still the core of, of our process uh, uh, about transformation, which is to assure that uh, the right to education is really for all. And uh, when we talk about Afghanistan, uh, uh, by the way, UNESCO, as you may remember, dedicated the 24th January uh, this year to Afghan girls and women, not to be forgotten and not to forget that this is really something unacceptable and uh, I mean to be banned from uh, schools and uh, universities. And you can count on us, uh, uh, all of us, uh, Minister uh, um, uh, of Bangladesh and Minister of Pakistan actually explain how their countries are contributing in hosting at university level students oh. from that country and, uh, and uh, how they are contributing most importantly to ensure that the spirit of the Transforming Education Summit is now translated into concrete actions in the classrooms across uh, all your countries uh, uh, and I think that this is the, the, the common mission we have. So thank you once again uh, very much. Uh, I will. I wish also to 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 give a special thank to uh, my wise and dear friend Leonardo, who's always so inspiring, all, always very much going straight to the point. I love very much your response to the the tricky question of how. Entrepreneur, entrepreneur uh, education can be uh, impactful more and better. Of course, uh, the relationship between economy uh, and the economic systems and the education system is one of the topics we want and uh, we wish to, to, to include in the roadmap in the coming months and years. And lastly, but most importantly, let me thank really uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, all the young people today. Uh, our very, very agile, effective moderator, uh, Armel Nishina, for, the, uh, for her eye-opening presentation, and of course, Sylvain Array and Elam once again. I think uh, your energy, your, you know, passion uh, is a kind of infectious for all of us. And I'm really confident that uh, we, with all of you, with young people like you, uh, uh, um, at the heart of the process, the future of education uh, in the LDC is really, really 
in good hands, despite the many challenges still uh, around us. I thank you, all of you, once again, and let's keep working to transform education together. Thank you all very much. As the director said, let's keep the momentum on and let's give a round of applause for our ministers.